I'm Brian Pollock, I'm the manager of STEM Resources at Cincinnati Museum Center. We're teaming up with Kent State University researchers, COSI, and La Soup, a local food rescue nonprofit based in Cincinnati, to bring you some food science programming. I'm in my own kitchen today, and uh, since we've all been staying at home more, I've been watching a lot of movies, and when I watch movies, I love to have popcorn. So, popcorn is on the menu today. Uh, I'm going to make it on the stovetop. A lot of people make it in the microwave, which is totally fine, but it's really easy to make it on the stovetop too. Uh, if you've never done it before, it can be really fun. So I have popcorn here, and if you've never seen the unpopped kernels, this is what they look like. They're pretty dry and very, very hard. If I were to try to bite into this, I would risk breaking a tooth. Um, so popcorn is a special kind of corn, but it's not the only kind of corn. I have a couple other kinds here. So this is ordinary popcorn. This is sweet corn. This is the kind of corn that you have if you buy frozen or canned corn or if you have can on the, uh, corn on the cob. And this is called dent corn. Uh, also sometimes called feed corn um, or field corn. So this is the kind that we normally would give to uh, livestock for feed or things like that. Um, people don't eat it in this form, although it is sometimes used for other things like cornstarch. All the different kinds of corn are related to each other. Corn was developed by people living in southern Mexico about 9,000 years ago. And the original corn plant had an ear that was only about an inch long. It didn't have lots of big kernels on it or anything like that. But through years and years and generations and generations of selective breeding, looking for the biggest uh, cobs with the most kernels on them, we, um, they were able to develop a wide variety of corn that we have today. There's six different main types of corn, but among that there's thousands of varieties. Um, but popcorn is special because the outer shell of the popcorn, uh, called the pericarp, is very thick and very hard. And so it forms like a, an outer shell encasing what's on the inside. And on the inside of that, are starches and some naturally occurring moisture. So when we heat it up, the moisture inside there, the water inside the kernel starts to boil. And it, when it boils, it produces lots and lots of pressure, which causes the outer shell to burst open in an explosion. That's a type of explosion called a boiling, uh, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. It's the same kind of explosion we use at some of our events at Cincinnati Museum Center when we launch ping pong balls in the air by putting liquid nitrogen into a two liter bottle and waiting for it to explode. So that explosion happens, the outer shell bursts open and the starches on the inside expand out and freeze in place and they get really, really big and that's what causes the popcorn to be fluffy and soft instead of chewy. Um, so I know that the water inside, the naturally occurring water inside the popcorn is uh, really important for how it cooks and how it pops. So I'm gonna do an experiment in the kitchen today. I want to know what difference does it make if we have more water? So I have a third of a cup of regular dry popcorn kernels here. And then I took a third of a cup and I soaked them overnight. So that's what's in this one. And you can see that there's a little bit more volume in the ones that were soaked. So they brought in some of that moisture. It's also a little bit softer. I can actually push my fingernail into that outer shell a little bit. So I want to see what difference does it make if we do that. Now we're doing an experiment, which means we want to test just that one question. What difference does it make if I soak my popcorn kernels? So I'm going to try to hold everything else exactly the same between my two batches and let's see what difference it makes. All right, to make popcorn on the stove, I don't need very much. I have a third of a cup of popcorn. I'm going to be using one tablespoon of oil, and we want our oil to have a pretty high smoke point. So I'm using sunflower oil, 
but you could use a wide variety of different oils. Regular old vegetable oil is fine. I wouldn't, however, use olive oil or butter or something like that because they get really smoky really fast and they can't quite handle the heat. I also need a pot big enough for the final popped volume of popcorn. So that's this pot right here for me. Uh, and uh, I may need to make sure it has a lid because if I don't have a lid on my pot, when those popcorn kernels start to explode, they're gonna jump out of the pot. So I'm gonna preheat my pot here on sort of a medium heat. And I'm gonna get the oil in there. Again, one tablespoon of oil. And then I like to know when things are ready to pop. So what I typically do is grab just a handful of kernels, maybe five or so, and put them in the bottom of the pot. And when they start to pop, then I know everything is ready to start popping. So my oil is in there, small handful of kernels, and we'll wait for those to start popping. And then once they start popping, I'm gonna pour all the rest in and put the lid on it, and we'll see what happens. All right, it's starting to pop, so I'm gonna put the rest of them in and then put the lid on and give it a little bit of a shake. Now we are using heat in the kitchen today, so we wanna make sure that we're careful the whole time. And make sure you have a grown-up's permission before you start cooking, um, because this can be a little bit dangerous. All right, you may start to see already that there's some steam forming in there, and it's gonna to start to fog over our glass lid here. I'm giving this a shake every now and then, so that uh, the popped kernels get off the bottom of the pan and they don't start to burn. So I'm watching as this goes. I can smell a little bit of it too. It doesn't smell too strongly, but I can smell it. And then I'm gonna start to listen, and I'm listening for when the popping goes down and we only have a pop every two or three seconds or so. When that happens, we'll know most of the kernels that are going to pop have popped. And if I leave it in any longer than that, it's going to start to burn. All right, you can really see a lot of the water that has escaped is starting to fog up that lid. If your lid fits really tight and it won't let any of that steam escape, it's not a bad idea to, to tip it just a little bit so the steam can escape. Alright, so it looks like we're mostly done. Alright, so they're done popping. I'm going to take over here and put it in a container. I'm using two identical containers because I want to know what the volume of this is. Oh, yep, it smells like popcorn now. So I'm going to pour this out into my little container here. You can see some of the ones that are on the bottom got a little bit more cooked than the ones at the top. It's pretty normal to have just a couple that are maybe a little burnt, but not too bad. We did pretty good this time, so that looks good. All right, I'm gonna put my pan back on the stove and get my second batch ready. So I wanna make sure that this pan isn't too hot. I want it to be about the same as when it was preheating for the other one, so that we start from the same sort of temperature for both batches. This time, I'm gonna be using my soaked kernels in my second batch. Now, when we put something with water into hot oil, that can be pretty dangerous. Um, things will splatter. And so I'm gonna make sure I have my lid ready to go. I'm gonna wipe the moisture out of my lid for two, two reasons. One, I don't want there to be too much moisture in there. Uh, and two, I wanna make sure that everything is exactly the same for my second experiment. All right, so I'm doing another experiment. I'm testing to see what difference does it make if I soak my kernels. So if I'm doing an experiment and I want to answer that question, I'm gonna use soaked kernels instead of unsoaked kernels. Which oil should I use this time? Should I use the same oil I used last time, the sunflower oil, or should I switch up and try with olive oil this time? 
How much of it should I use? Last time I used one tablespoon. How much oil should I use this time? Which pot should I use? Same pot I used the first time, or should I try a different pot this time? All right, so I hope you know the answers to those. We're gonna keep everything else exactly the same. So I'm gonna turn my burner on to medium heat, the same heat it was at last time. I'm gonna measure out one tablespoon of the sunflower oil. That's the same oil we used last time. And we're gonna put that in there and preheat the pan just until we start to see a couple of these pop. So there's a couple in there. And you may be able to hear that there's a little bit of splattering going on because there's a lot more moisture this time. And so it sounds like maybe if you fry something on the stove or saute something, that's what it sort of sounds like to me. There's also quite a lot of steam already developing. All right, so we've started to get a couple of little pops. I'm gonna put the rest in and cover it right away because all of that steam is going to start to build up. I'm going to try to do a good job of shaking it also. And listening for those pops. I'm going to tilt this a lot, a little bit because we've got a lot of steam there. Just to let that steam out. I don't want to do it too much because I don't want things flying away. And I don't want to change the experiment too much either. But I do want to make sure that we don't get a lot of steam build up. I can smell this. This one smells a little bit different than last time. It's got sort of a more cooked smell. A bit of a corny smell to it. It sounds different too. Last time the pops were high pitched. Pop! These ones are low pitched. They're thumps. So I'm still getting a lot of popping going on. So we're going to keep doing this. It almost sounds like fireworks. So it sounds like it's mostly done popping. I'm going to take it off the heat, give it a couple more seconds. Whoop. Mm. It's inconsistent on how, off, how long it takes between pops on this one. So we still have some pops happening, even though we waited a couple seconds. Okay. We're starting to get some things burning on there too, so I want to make sure that we don't get too much burning. And I'm going to pour this into the same container here, and see what it looks like. Oh boy, did that make a difference, look at that. So you can see that a lot of these did pop. So here's an example of a kernel that popped. Right? And I have several of these. They popped but they didn't get as warm or as a uh, as large. So here's let's do four kernels of popped soaked corn versus four kernels of popped unsoaked corn. It made a huge difference in the volume of these. I'm going to do a taste test too because no cooking experiment is ever really complete until we get to taste it. So 
really light and fluffy. Tastes like ordinary popcorn. I haven't added any salt or butter or anything. It's still really tasty. Um, easy to eat and fluffy. All right, I'm going to try my very, very, very small popcorn kernel here. Really crunchy. I can still feel the, the texture of that hull, that husk in there. And it's pretty hard. I can eat it. It's soft enough to eat. I don't think I'd want to munch on this during the movies, though. Um, but people differ on this. In fact, um, one of my favorite snacks of all time was partially popped popcorn before it went, oh, it was discontinued. Um, it's a little bit different from this, but you may want to try it out. And uh, you may want to try different amounts of time soaking. These soaked for overnight, so they soaked for a pretty good long time. But if you soaked it for a different amount of time, it may make a difference in how it comes out. So that's an experiment you can do on your own. Um, popcorn is amazing. It's really, really versatile. In our house, we make caramel corn from time to time. Uh, and there's a lot of really cool chemistry that goes into that. There's Maillard reactions. Um, if you want really soft caramel, you add a little bit of baking soda, which changes the pH of it and causes bubbles to form and makes the caramel uh, much softer. So it's a really fun thing to experiment with. Uh, and if you're handy in the kitchen, you may want to give that a try too. Um, if you're interested in this activity and you want to see a recipe and more information about it, you can check the link. Uh, in that activity, there's also a survey that's being conducted by our friends at Kent State University about programs like this and about this program in particular. So we'd appreciate it if you check that out and check out that survey too. If you want to see more activities like this one and more videos, check our website, cincymuseum.org, and follow us on social media. You'll see videos with me and lots of other videos. We've got dance party videos and videos about making and videos with uh, interviews with scientists. Lots of fun videos there, so go ahead and check that out. Again, cincymuseum.org. As an educational nonprofit, we rely on ticket sales to operate. And right now, because we're closed, that revenue is just not possible. So if you enjoyed this activity, I hope you'd consider supporting Cincinnati Museum Center by donating at the link. Thanks again. I'm Brian. See you next time.